Okay, now as we continue on through the day and uh, through the week and through the month and all the way up until the presidential election, I'm sure trying to explain to people that there's a difference between vulture capitalism, a.k.a. leveraged buyouts, a.k.a. private equity. In other words, how Mitt Romney got rich, not contributing anything to anything. And venture, good old fashioned venture capitalism, angel investor, you know, American capital. There's a difference between these two things. We'll get back to more of that in just a few minutes. But uh, there's also the issue of how do you play football if nobody builds a football field? Very simple question. David Harsani is with us. He's with humanevents.com, Human Events Online, senior reporter. David Walker, a nationally syndicated columnist. David, David Walker for the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You, uh, you wrote a piece saying J.P. Morgan proves we don't need more regulations. So let me, let me just ask you this question. How, do, how can you play a football game if you don't have referees, goalposts, and rules? Well, you have tons of rules, and you have referees already. Um, I mean, I think my point is, the macro point is that we have to let people who take on risky risky uh, investments, we have to let them pay the price for their, for their risk, not either stop them, because risk is, a, uh, I think you'd agree, a, a healthy part of capitalism. Occasionally we lose and win. And, um, and that if, if we continue to inject moral hazard into markets in this way, we're going to either have a stale market, but more than that, we're going to let banks get away with stuff more and more because we have to save them every time. David, uh, it, uh, that sounds like gibberish. My, my question was, well, f- f- two questions, actually. The first, again, you know, we're establishing the marketplace. We allow banks to exist. We define the rules by which banks exist. The banking industry wouldn't exist if government hadn't established it, number one. And number two, do you really want your bank taking your checkbook deposit? and gambling with it, and maybe losing and losing all your money. Because that's what happened in 1920, well, basically 1930 through 1932, so that when Franklin Roosevelt came into office, I mean, within a week of his coming into office, virtually every bank in the United States had failed. And the reason why was, you know, not just because of the Great Depression. They failed because these banks were making money on the side using their their passbook savings and, and checkbook deposits from average depositors to gamble in the stock market. That was made illegal in 1935. Phil Graham blew that up when he, with Graham Leach Bliley when he, when he blew out Glass-Steagall in 1999, made it legal again. It had been made legal b- back in 1920 when Harding came into office. He, he made that perfectly legal. There had been laws against it up until that point going, that went back to the Great Depression of 1897 or 93. I forget what year it was. But, the, you know, the one that, that, that led to the McKinley presidency, basically. And, and uh, so, you know, Phil Graham makes it legal for your bank to gamble with your savings account. And guess what? You know, just like when Harding decriminalized it in 1920, nine years later, the market crashed or the banks crashed. Bush, or actually it was the last year of the Clinton administration, it gets decriminalized largely by Phil Graham and his Republican buddies, and nine years later the economy crashes, and you still want the banks to use your checking account and my checking account to gamble? I don't get it. Yeah, but that's, but that's not the case. Bear Stearns, that is absolutely the case. Well, that Bear is what J.P. Morgan Chase was doing. Bear Stearns, well, let's go back a little bit. Bear Stearns is an investment bank, not a commercial bank. It has nothing to do with glass. I'm not talking about Bear Stearns. I'm talking about J.P. Morgan Chase. Your article is about how J.P. Morgan Chase proves we don't need regulations. Merrill Merrill Lynch had nothing to do with Glass-Steagall. So I'm just saying that you're blaming the entire financial collapse on on Glass-Steagall being blown out by Phil Graham. However, almost none of the banks in the financial uh, uh, meltdown in 2009 had anything to do. Glass-Steagall would not have stopped any of that, correct? No, that's wrong. Glass-Steagall okay. would have stopped a substantial amount of that. The, the bigger part, actually, was the second piece of legislation that Phil got, Graham got through on behalf of his wife, Wendy, who was on the board of directors of Enron. And this was at the, at the explicit and specific request of Ken Lay. And that was he wanted to be able to speculate in energy futures as if he was a bank. And he wanted to do it in a way that wasn't regulated by the banking regulators. So the Commodities Futures Modernization Act took a whole variety of types of, of gambling, of, of commodity gambling, 
out of the purview of the Commodity Futures uh, Exchange Board or whatever it's called, the, 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 the oversight agency. And thus you went from zero, zero unregulated derivatives in 1999 or in 2000 when this was passed. You went from zero up to somewhere between 700 and 900 trillion dollars worth at the time of the great crash and we're down to around 600 trillion dollars worth right now keeping keeping in mind the gdp of the entire planet is 65 trillion dollars a year this is still a disaster waiting to happen but that's not what we're talking okay. about here when we're talking about jp morgan chase jp morgan chase lost two billion dollars and much of that money was checkbook deposits people can open a checking account with jp morgan chase people can have a credit card with jp morgan chase in fact they're one of the largest credit card issuers of the country. Do you want them gambling with your money? If I didn't, I wouldn't give my money to J.P. Morgan. I but, know what J.P. Morgan does. I know they gamble my money. That's what private equity is, and that's what... That's not private know. equity. I'm sorry. That's what their risk-taking was. They were, by the way, hedging against risk, supposedly. I mean, clearly, they didn't do a very good job at it, but... They weren't hedging against risk. They were yeah, trying to make were. money. They were well, gambling. Yeah. Come on. You and I both know it. Yeah, they were... It, they were betting. Perfect. It's a gambling. I, I would like to see a two-tiered system where there are investment banks where I can put my money. I know what they're doing, and if they want to gamble it, they can. And commercial banks where I can put my money safely. That's insured. Well, you're talking about bringing back Glass Steagall. That's the exact opposite no, of what your not. article says. No, it's not bringing back Glass Steagall because I, I don't. That's I, all Glass Steagall said was you have to declare yourself either a commercial bank and you do checking and savings and and write mortgages, or an investment bank, and you take people's money and you invest it in the stock market, and you can charge a fee for it, or you can pass it through, whatever. Uh, you know, and, and it used to be that Merrill Lynch was an investment bank, and Chase was a commercial bank. Right. And now Chase is doing both, and so is Merrill Lynch for that well, matter. Let me, can I ask you a question? So if, if, if a bank loses $2 billion... How would you have stopped this loss? Do you think Glass-Steagall would have stopped this kind of loss? I mean, you think that, that money is not fungible no. in these large... No, 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 you're missing my point entirely. Okay. If, if J.P. Morgan Chase was purely an investment bank, in other words, if it was only a place where rich people put their money and said, hey, try and get me a good return on investment, or even average, you know, you know working people, you know, take their, their $10,000 life savings and, and gave it to J.P. Morgan Chase, and J.P. Morgan Chase lost it all, that's one of the risks of investing. Everybody understands that. That's disclosed to everybody. $2 billion, obviously, with a bank that's got assets over $150 billion, is not going to take down the bank. But it, that bank is sitting on the passbook savings of millions and millions of Americans and the checking accounts of tens of millions of Americans, excuse me, the credit card accounts of tens of millions of Americans. And if they had made, instead of a $2 billion mistake, a $20 billion mistake, which is, by the way, what happened back in 2007, then, yeah, they could take down the whole financial system. And therefore, they should, since they, can, they have the ability to destroy our economic commons, we have an obligation to regulate them in, in just, just enough that they can't destroy us. You keep making it sound like there's absolutely no, re there's no regulations. In, I mean, isn't the Justice Department looking into what J.P. Morgan did? I, I'm not sure what they Yeah, but they have illegal. very, very limited powers, and the Republicans in Congress are doing everything they can to not fund the, the, the few powers that they have under Dodd-Frank so that they can't be implemented. So, so if a bank loses $2 billion immediately, we have to say, listen, we need more regulatory control here because banks shouldn't lose $2 no, billion. No, it's just, it's just, it's just a good to, example. They have to deal in simplistic, in the most... No, we should have been saying this ever since 1999. That was crazy. But we just went through all the major banks that caused that supposedly caused this crisis, and I'm sure there's a lot more to it. Obviously, even if you if you put in Fannie and Freddie, they're not under Glass Steagall either. We we it wouldn't have no, and they should be. Um, you know, I'm with you on that, David David, David Harsani, uh, HumanEvents.com. You can read read the article over there. Unlike our friends in Washington, David Harsani. David, thanks you for being with us.